Um, I'm just um, going to jump straight in. Uh, I've, <laughs> I already changed a word in the title from what was advertised because uh, building sounded too much like um, bricks and mortar, which is fine. Um, well, no, it's not the huge embodied carbon in bricks and mortar. Um, and um, so I've actually used the word creating the future we want. Um, I think creating is a far more important word because it requires um, um, in even more of an imagination than what a physical building might look like. Um, and of course, it's the future we desperately need. Um, I uh, will rattle through some slides um, and uh, I will send um, to Harv and Bettina afterwards a PDF of them. Um, so you have, oh, um, uh, sorry, I'm just realizing there's people waiting to get in um, and I think I've lost the message. Um, oh, here we go. Good, I've actually managed to bring up a little ta um, tab that I can see people in the waiting room. Um, okay, no, that's good. Fine, thank you. Um, I was going to suggest um, some light summer reading. Um, sorry, I'm using um, light um, in a, um, a particular way. Um, it, um, the first one is um, this... Um, Fabulous speech last week at Columbia University by uh, Antonio Gores, uh, Guterres, the um, Secretary General of the United Nations. And um, very early in the speech, he said, um, dear friends, humanity is waging war on nature. This is suicidal. And um, it is a, um, uh, a very, very thoughtful, very articulate, very direct speech about what's going on. And there's a, a link on that page, not only to um, uh, to the United Nations uh, web page, but then on that page there is a video as well, should you want to um, look at it. In terms of um, how we might respond to these issues, um, two books that I've greatly enjoyed um, in recent months uh, from two of my heroes. Um, the first one is from um, uh, Jonathan Porritt, his book Hope in Hell. This is literally the last decade in which authentic grounded hope will be available to anchor everything we do to serve our families, friends and future generations. Um, no alternative but to commit to more radical political action to get as many people as possible involved in campaigning activities just as often as possible. To bring such pressure to bear on our political systems while we still have time to shift from today's wholly inadequate incrementalism to full on emergency response. Um, that's um, the case um, for civil disobedience is now overwhelming, nonviolent um, civil disobedience, Jonathan um, um, obviously suggests or recommends. Um, Porritt being, um, indeed if the name's familiar, he is indeed the son of a former governor general, um, uh, but all his, most of his life and work has been in the UK, although in recent years he's been um, contributing a lot more here in New Zealand and absolutely um, a preeminent leader um, in the um, environmental movement um, in the UK. The other person is uh, Cristiana Figueres who chaired the United Nations climate change negotiations from immediately after the collapse and failure of the Copenhagen negotiations through to the successful um, climax and, and conclusion of the Paris Agreement five years ago. And she's still a very formidable um, uh, diplomat um, for on climate issues. This link is to a, a short um, little TED talk she did um, recently, about seven minutes, I very much recommended uh, recommend it to you and she talks about the case for stubborn optimism um, and um, she has um, developed this at length uh, with one of her colleagues from the um, Paris um, negotiations, Tom Rivet Karnak, the future we choose um, about surviving the climate crisis. Um, of course it's not all, both of these books are not narrowly about um, the climate crisis, i.e. what's happening with the climate, um, but it's um, with um, all the um, interrelated issues around climate. Um, so it's not just um, 
uh, fossil fuel emissions which are causing the change in climate, but it's about the way we grow food, it's the way we build buildings, it's the way we use roads and the like. And um, so uh, they, are, they are very um, full views of the issues um, uh, confronting us. Um, so I'm just checking whether anybody's in the meeting room. I don't think so, in the waiting room. Uh, let me know, Bettina, if you think there is, and I will um, um, act on that. So I, I want to just traverse three points um, uh, in these slides. I want to talk very briefly about um, COVID-19 um, and then the planet and then um, our terror. Uh, essentially, what I'm going to say about the um, planet, uh, sorry, the um, pandemic, um, I'm going to draw from um, a series of um, surveys of senior business decision makers around the world that Bloomberg has been making all the way through the COVID pandemic. And now, um, so this is from uh, the September version of that. And it, um, you can see there's a whole bunch of countries um, running from New Zealand down to Cambodia. Um, we're all scored on four things down the bottom there on the right hand corner, uh, purpose, political governance, stability, the blue is um, tactics, um, measures and, e uh, and measures in economic reopening. Um, the greenier one is healthcare and containment to handle pandemic crisis. And the um, purple one's a really interesting one, people's and society's spirit and resilience in uncertain times. Um, you can see how we score. Uh, we actually outscore on all four measures, uh, all of the other countries. Um, so that, Bloomberg ranks us top. So it's not just about health, uh, it's not just about economics, it's not just about politics, um, but it's also um, very much about... Um, uh, now, sorry, I saw John Stulen's... Um, so uh, uh, I think he seems to be in. I um, uh, um, apologise that I'm talking backwards and forwards. Um, so uh, it, it's about um, our full um, response there, um, which is um, uh, um, very encouraging. However, um, what we've got here in New Zealand, as indeed elsewhere around the world, is not a V-shaped um, recession or a U-shaped or a double dip W or an L down and no recovery. It's a K-shaped one where there's winners, people who hold financial and housing assets, companies that are proactive, innovative, <laughs> resilient, um, companies in digital businesses and essential services. And um, typically here in New Zealand, older, higher skilled, Pakeha men in secure jobs. There's obviously some range, but we people like me are the luckiest. The losers are anyone with no financial or housing assets, companies that are passive and insecure, companies with no competitive advantages, and um, wage earners, casually employed women, and those in insecure jobs, um, more typically Maori and Pacifica than others, um, because they have disadvantages in pay, skills, housing, health, and the rest. And um, this is um, the most extreme um, recession and recovery from recession I've ever seen in my decades as um, a business journalist. Um, and um, I think we're acutely aware um, of that um, extraordinary dichotomy in society, a very damaging um, dichotomy. So uh, what might we do about it? Um, Martin Wolf, chief economics columnist of the Financial Times, uh, one of my favorite writers said in July, we are living in an era of multiple crises, COVID-19, a crisis of economic disappointment, a crisis of democratic legitimacy, a crisis of the global commons, which of course is climate, mm -hmm. other sustainability issues, a crisis of international relations, mm -hmm. and a crisis of global government governance. We do not know how to deal with all of these. This is partly because um, it's hard to develop the needed ideas for reform, yet is far more because politics cannot deliver um, the necessary changes. But some really interesting things are going on and um, um, spurred um, by the pandemic. So this is from back in May from the Smith School at Oxford University, the School of Enterprise and the Environment. COVID-19 has already triggered major shifts in individual behaviors, social practices, beliefs, 
the role of government in the economy and relationship between nations and international institutions. These shifts have occurred on remarkably rapid timescales. Um, I could do a very lengthy presentation on all the positive things I'm seeing in New Zealand um, in this line, most particularly around um, astonishing speed and scale and um, sureness of innovation in New Zealand organizations, not just in business. At, and um, that's very welcome. Um, but we are still not um, substantially shifting away from um, our paradigms, our models um, that have got us into this mess um, in um, climate and sustainability and economic and inequality and all the other issues. Uh, we're still very much investing and as in business as it was um, rather than business as it needs to be. Um, very encouraging news though. So this is from um, the UK Climate Change Committee yesterday, their time, uh, news overnight. They, this is an extremely detailed report on its sixth five-year carbon budget. So as a country, they've been at this now for 12 years, um, since 2008. Um, I'll come back to New Zealand's performance on this in due course. Um, and um, this is um, really, uh, they use the word landmark, uh, this thousand page report, um, but the other responses to it, um, such as this from The Guardian, or another one from Business Green, which is one of my favorite um, UK websites on sustainability issues, uh, very much seriously businessly oriented. Um, uh, this is um, an, an extraordinary breakthrough because it's showing that these transitions that we need are considerably more affordable than we thought they were. And we already knew they were heading that way, already were. And um, okay. uh, this is also very importantly, um, the, um, this is also very, sorry, this is also um, very importantly, um, um, the most integrated view of all this that's ever been produced and wide lessons for us uh, here in New Zealand and indeed in other countries. So various other sources on all of these things. Um, the World Economic Forum has a big new section that it calls the Great Reset um, on how we might tackle um, all of these issues. Um, I can thoroughly recommend that. But I always come back to this work from the um, Stockholm Resilience Center, which is a, the planetary boundaries, the geophysical chemical boundaries of the planet. And the biggest overshoot is down there at seven o'clock, biochemical, biogeochemical flows uh, from, of phosphorus and nitrogen globally because of the way we grow food globally. And that's all about artificial fertilizers. Then land change, sort of nine o'clock, um, very substantial impact. Um, and a lot of that land change issue is not just around urban issues, um, but again, uh, around sort of food production. And uh, the biggest overshoot so far is biosphere integrity in genetic diversity, i.e. diverse species, um, i.e. Um, species extermination, extinction, uh, which is running at an extraordinary rate which is again what um, Guterres was speaking of in part um, in his speech last week. And um, so we have to think about how we can um, make sure everything we do uh, as humans works within those planetary boundaries. So that's the ceiling on what we have to work on. Kate Rayworth is my favorite economist. Um, she has taken that ecological ceiling. She has given us the social floor, which is the United Nations Human Development Index, and we can see all the things we need as individuals, as communities, as societies, um, if we are to um, progress. We need political voice, peace and justice, income, housing, networks, energy, you name it. And what she's plotting there is the measured shortfall on all of those things. And so what we've got to do is try to lift everybody up above that floor so then they can be um, uh, well-empowered people, strong societies that can come up with the decisions we need, but working within that ecological system. If you only read one book um, in the next few months, please, please read Donut Economics, uh, Kate's book um, about all of that, and how we end up at a regenerative economy that's rebuilding those, letting nature rebuild those ecosystems and distributive by design so we don't get these huge um, inequalities. Well, what about New Zealand? 
Well, first of all, we're not the climate leaders we think we are. So if we look at our net emissions, and this is even including all those trees we've planted to net out some of our emissions, that's where we've been since 1990. Whereas the United Kingdom, which has been on this, its emissions reduction journey since 2008, um, is showing that considerable um, fall there and various countries in between. Um, in fact, uh, we are the second worst amongst Annex I countries. Those are the OECD countries plus um, uh, countries on the cusp of um, um, coming into the um, um, uh, OECD um, and Annex I countries in the United Nations um, climate negotiations framework. Um, so we're second to Turkey, who are stellar at this, and we rank uh, close to Cyprus and Canada not far behind us. And then of course we see um, the countries that have made substantial reductions over on the other side, um, whether through economic failure, which is the story with the Russian Federation and some other countries, um, or by um, very good design, such as Sweden on the far right. The, um, I won't dwell on this, it's all in the PDF, um, and uh, about how the commitments we've made out to 2030 internationally we promised only not to increase very much um, our emissions from the 1990 level, leaving this heroic work in the following tw 20 years to get to net zero by 2050. So, but this is crazy. If we don't get this next decade right, and we're already one year into it, um, then our, our task in um, New Zealand, as indeed elsewhere in the world, becomes impossible. And this is a piece my newsroom colleague, uh, Mark Dalder, wrote about this uh, recently. Yet we have these abundant opportunities to decarbonize the economy in New Zealand across all of these sectors. Um, I, I could talk at length about them, um, and I won't um, in the interests of time. Um, but I do want to dwell on this point, that 2021, uh, just around the corner, is our very big year because that's when our Climate Change Commission um, um, proposes and then the government has to decide um, on what our first three five-year carbon budgets are and the emissions reduction pathways that will get us to 2035. So they will publish their draft um, budgets and pathways on February 1st. We've got six weeks to um, offer our views on that. So I'd encourage everyone to um, um, read what um, Rod Carr, the chair of the Climate Commission is promising, will only be a, a hundred page a document with adjacent to it, 600 pages of all the um, scientific evidence they've drawn on for their 100 pages. But please, please, please uh, have a deep think about this. Put in either individually or with others or in your organizations and put in your submission. But, but then by May, the commission will put its final proposals to government and the government has a, a, a legal, a statutory obligation under the Zero Carbon Act um, to give its decisions by the end of the year. Um, the Climate Commission is very accessible. They are running fabulous um, once a week seminars, webinars online, um, um, which is very accessible, very encouraging. And again, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. But the other big thing is that by this time next year, um, the um, uh, 26th um, uh, annual United Nations climate negotiations um, postponed a year um, from now to next year uh, will have happened in Glasgow, first two weeks of November. So all countries are, uh, are, are required to bring a more, under the Paris Agreement five years ago, are required to bring a, a more ambitious pledge to that no, those negotiations and a pledge that is consistent with only a one and a half degree rise in temperature on the planet whereas our current commitment is closer to consistency, to being um, a three degrees rise. Um, so there's lots of work to do. This is a quote from the Productivity Commission all the way back in 2017, but again, it's a huge work on the low emissions economy and our transition to it um, is still very readable, very important. So uh, key, key quote, the shift from the old economy to a new low emissions economy will be profound and widespread transforming land use, the energy system, production methods and technology, the regulatory framework and institutions, and business and political culture. 
And it's that last line about business and political culture, which is obviously actually the most important because that's how we respond. Um, it's our ambitions, it's about how we work together. And I do see some progress on that, both in certainly in business um, to some extent, but less so in political culture. Um, but um, um, that's those, those culture issues are uh, absolutely essential ones for, to work on. In terms of um, people out there doing interesting things, the Aotearoa Circle um, is one of my favorites. Um, business and government leaders, um, a group formed in 2018. Jonathan Porritt was one of the founders, along with Rob Fennick, who very sadly died too young this March, um, and we miss him greatly. Um, and um, their first very substantial piece of work um, underway the last couple of years, it was on sustainable finance. And that report, that final report out about a month ago, um, sets us excellently on a journey with uh, to sustainable finance, tremendous buy-in by banks and all sorts of other um, financial organizations. I think we're really going places um, on that. And um, during lockdown, they um, had um, the Fennec Forum, which looked at food, transport, and energy. Um, and you'll find um, their work on their website um, on that. Um, other very encouraging um, developments is the new um, primary sector strategy, um, brought to us by the Primary Sector Council, good representation across the sector, fit for a better world, and, and regenerative agriculture, i.e. significantly changing in the way we use land and the way we farm. So we're giving that uh, land and that water a chance to regenerate um, is very central to this. So that's um, the second document here alongside it, um, the strategy um, is um, Tayal, um, the, um, the um, Maori worldview and, and the um, framework in which this strategy for the sector is being pursued. And there's reasonably good buy-in around um, some key players in the primary sector um, and government on that. Uh, I have some connection with Pure Advantage. Um, the great information source on uh, our sustainable things. Um, and that's through my Edmund Hillary Fellowship work. Collectively, we've been doing a lot of work on our regenerative future. And this is a link to it. Um, we've looked mostly at regenerative agriculture, but we've also looked at regenerative tourism. And I, I won't um, tell you much about that now, um, but I will just um, make this little plug, if I may. Um, on Tuesday of this week, BWB published this book, 100% Pure Future, New Zealand's Tourism Renewed. It's a collection of eight essays. Um, the contributors are listed there. I'm one of those essay writers. Um, and um, this was our collective approach um, to imagine um, how tourism changes, not just because we're not currently getting any international tourists into the country, um, but because of the, the way tourism can play a far deeper, richer, um, and um, constructive role um, in our ecosystems, our economy, our society, and our culture. And this is what the eight of us are arguing for. This is now back to Kate Rayworth's uh, donut economy, um, but this is it um, reimagined um, with a lot of um, by um, Tagata uh, Fenua, um, uh, and wonderfully encouraged in this um, by um, two terrific young people I know, Juhi Sharif and Priti Ambani, um, both uh, relatively new New Zealanders, both from the UK. Um, Juhi originally a Pakistani um, um, family background and Priti from Indian, um, but, um, and so wonderfully uh, New Zealanders. Um, and Kate Rayworth's been very involved in this work too. Um, and um, she's very encouraging um, of us in New Zealand um, to bring together donut economy principles um, with uh, to our Māori, a Māori worldview um, as to how we um, um, progress things here in New Zealand. Kate was here last year. These are links to two of her presentations and uh, I'm perhaps throwing a slide on a third one. Um, into the PDF, uh, where she um, um, talks a lot about New Zealand 
Um, and um, we now have a Donut uh, Economics Association or Advocates of New Zealand. Um, and um, so this is a good source to um, see how we're working through these um, opportunities here in New Zealand. And on that website, there is wonderful explanations um, of Donut Economics, um, but looking at it in um, a New Zealand context. And so um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan on this. Another source when we think about um, um, how we get large scale collective action, this was a book earlier in the year, another BWB text, or a so full book, I should say, from Max Rash book um, about a government for the public good. And I think it's an incredibly timely book um, for um, the um, situation we're in today. I'll end on two final thoughts. Um, uh, so about some more heroes um, for me. Um, Generation Zero are absolutely one of them. They're the people who were deeply, deeply disappointed um, by the failure of the Copenhagen climate um, negotiations and uh, came back to New Zealand and determined that they would be the first generation to be of zero carbon. And um, I think they are by far our most um, effective um, advocacy group in New Zealand because uh, young, they have a passion, a vision, um, you know, un, not bringing too much baggage of vested interests and old thinking and all the rest, but brilliant, most importantly, all, absolutely brilliant at, at building understanding and coalition. So when in 2016, in front of the Beehive, they launched a campaign for a Zero Carbon Act, um, essentially nobody turned up. I think there was about a dozen people, but they persevered. The following year, Labour adopted a Zero Carbon Act um, as the campaign promise, and late last year, the Zero Carbon Act became law. Technically, it was a, um, uh, an amendment to our Climate Change Response Bill, uh, but it's called the brackets Zero Carbon um, Response. Um, and that's what's created the framework of, for example, the um, Climate Change Commission and um, many other really important frameworks. But the point is, these frameworks are barely populated with any kind of policy. So yes, I'm a firm believer in declaring, uh, as we did as a country last week, um, a climate emergency, um, because that's how urgent these things are, um, but how we have to focus um, and respond because this is very urgent. We might think we've got 10 or 20 or 30 years to solve some of these problems, but actually we, um, but that's human time. In earth time, the earth is responding with a warp speed um, in terms of how fast um, planet um, and um, other um, deep manifestations of unsustainability in terms of ecosystem um, degradation and destruction and species lost is moving. Uh, time is very limited, which brings me on looping back to Jonathan and Christiana's point about um, non-direct um, um, civil disobedience. Back um, September last year, 170,000 people marched that day. Um, that was the school, one of the school um, climate strikes. And that um, about 170,000 people marched that day in New Zealand. It was our second largest public protest ever. Um, that was about 3.7% of the New Zealand population. But very interestingly, 3.5% um, is deemed to be the threshold at which protests successfully trigger big social and political changes which transform societies. And that's the work of Erica uh, Chinoeth of um, Harvard University on her work um, that continues, but has been going on for many years now, looking at such actions, um, violent, nonviolent, revolution, you know, you name it, various categories, um, uh, about 300, and, uh, it's now more than 323 mass actions in countries around the world. And it's the nonviolent ones, uh, which are by far the most successful. Um, and um, so that's why, and here's links to a, a couple of um, Erica's work, pieces of work. So that's why um, I think it's really important for us to think of our, ourselves, um, how we respond as leaders. Um, and first of all, in individuals, in the decisions that we make, um, but in the, in the work we then do with others on this collectively. 
and, and, and that sense that um, we can't leave it to the government. The government is willing, but it can only move as fast as the majority of the public um, are prepared to go. Yeah, um, I'm on a webinar. And, um, so you. therefore, um, we have to um, make sure that we are leading and then the politicians are delivering what we want. And that's um, how democracy has to work these days. And I think we have some willing people in politics, um, particularly um, in the prime minister and some of her cabinet members and others um, um, uh, uh, would do more um, if they felt that there was the public buy-in and support for more. And the Prime Minister is very good at explaining things and encouraging people to get involved, as she was um, uh, and continues to be through the pandemic. Um, but now we need to take the lessons we have learned from the pandemic about how we respond as a society and how there is this incredible opportunity um, to put right a lot of things wrong in society, not the least of which climate and all the other um, sustainability issues um, and in that same process we can make substantial inroads on inequality um, and health and all the other um, issues that are, um, are dogging us. So that's my pitch to you um, as to how um, uh, I'm suggesting we need to respond and I just leave you with one last quote. This is from Rachel Carson very much the the mother of the modern environmental movement, and um, particularly with, well, all of her work, but particularly with her book, Silent Spring, in uh, 1962. This is a quote from Silent Spring. The human race is challenged more than ever before to demonstrate our mastery, not over nature, but of ourselves. Thanks very much. And I'm just gonna stop sharing. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. Um, I'm Park. And, and then uh, you're very welcome to claim back the hosting. <laughs> Half. Excellent. Uh, no, no, we'll keep you as host. Uh, Rod, so, uh, Rod, I'm always amazed at how much shit that you know. It is fabulous. Thank you very much. So, and it's generally pretty interesting stuff. Rich Orton has got a question here. In your view, Rod, what's New Zealand's biggest obstacle to reducing carbon? Um, uh, uh, this is going to sound really um, lame in one sense. Um, but uh, it, it actually, it, it's not about the technology at all. And it's not about the economics. And um, both of those are, are, are tailwinds behind us on this. Um, it is actually um, a, 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 a failure of imagination to put those things together, uh, a failure of ambition to do so. But on the negative side, um, uh, we're obviously dealing with a bell curve of people. And so there are some terribly enthusiastic and, and bright and adventurous people at one end, but there's some really, really resistant people on the other um, who fear um, that they will miss out hugely. So the whole concept of a just transition in this um, is incredibly important. And, um, uh, and again, that's something the government has articulated, but yet to give um, any um, substance to. Um, how that we can bring everybody on this journey. But that doesn't mean if you've got some asset which is going to be stranded by this means that you're going to be compensated for it because there ain't enough money, even with quantitative easing necessarily to compensate everybody who would love to keep doing what they're doing and making money the way they are now forever and um, when they can't. And so um, it's bringing those um, vested interests into the tent and um, being able to persuade them that... Um, they have a responsibility, um, they have an obligation, and there is a future for them if they are on the journey. Um, and um, those are the people that we have to work on. Yesterday, um, I spent the day with um, a major gen tailor, um, it's Genesis Energy, which has um, made a commitment to um, science-based targets, i.e. reducing its emissions, um, um, in line with that one and a half degree target. And this is, um, uh, you, you have to be approved by a coalition of science bodies based in New York to be able to claim a science-based target. And um, the, um, um, 
they've you know, are, are still a large emitter because of um, coal and um, gas being burnt at Huntley. Um, and so, um, but they are very engaged about um, how they can play a role in the um, uh, electricity uh, revolution. So it's about how we um, electrify a lot of things that we're using fossil fuels for at the moment, not the least of which transport, um, but also industrial heat and process are um, the other big issues. Um, but so how we can get displace fossil fuels with electricity there, but then how we generate the electricity and how we make sure that um, over time, and I'm no advocate of shooting to 100 degrees, 100% renewable, renewable um, on um, uh, electricity generation. Um, I think that's the wrong target. We should be focusing on getting, using electricity to get people out of fossil fuels. And, and, um, uh, and, and then in due course, deal with the last few percentage points um, of fossil fuels in um, electricity. So um, there are um, organizations, there are people um, that uh, are very keen to move, that they're doing the best they can, but we're not getting it together as a country, which is why I think next year is fundamentally important because the Climate Change um, um, Commission um, is giving us that roadmap. And, and the commissioners are just a fabulous bunch of people. They are so good. Rod Carr, the chair, is so articulate um, on all this um, and, um, uh, and explains the issues so well. That's why I'm just urging everybody to just dive into all this stuff, get your heads around it. Um, because if we fail on this, and everything else becomes pretty irrelevant, quite frankly. Well, the other interesting thing about Rob Clark is that he's positive. You know, he, yeah. he, he, he puts out a very positive vibe, doesn't he? It's not like doom and gloom. He's going, we can do this, which is, which is, which is very nice to hear. Yeah, but uh, crucially, he also um, is very good at um, laying it all out in terms of, you know, the risk, the complexity, and the decisions yet to be made. Um, and um, so, so that's why I think he's tremendously effective. Yep. So I've got a question here from David Wilson. Uh, you might include public servants in your list of winners from COVID-19. Okay. So where to from here for the productive economy? Um, well, first of all, I just pick up on um, public servants. Um, um, some of them have... Um, um, quite a few of them have played really important roles um, over this um, last six um, months or so. Um, but also, uh, and this was better during the, the height of lockdown, for example, uh, the first lockdown, uh, there was quite a lot of innovation going on um, in the way, say, for example, business was working with government to um, try and work through how to make things function um, during lockdown. And, and um, I think a good bit of that has gone away. Um, the public services tended, like other parts of society have, to try to settle back into some well-established patterns. And um, so um, it, um, we need to encourage them to move on. But in terms of the productive economy, um, I won't, um, I, look, I can broadly articulate um, in pretty much every sector of the economy what this future looks like. I'm not going to attempt to do that now um, because we've only got an hour. <laughs> and um, I, I am superficial. I'm, I'm offering, I can only offer um, broad themes, um, um, but I think they're very robust themes. I think they are, are very robust arguments and evidence at that high level. Um, and so um, for me, one of the great um, pleasures of my work um, is having the chance to be, as a journalist, to be around um, people, organizations, companies, you, know, you name it, and as they work through the intense detail uh, of, of trying to, um, and, and complexity of building strategies to do all this. So look, I, I am optimistic. I can articulate that view. And then I can put you in touch with people pretty much in any sector out there um, who um, share that sense of, um, uh, of opportunity and adventure and necessity. Um, um, so a big thumbs up to the productive economy. 
And you know, I, I include the dairy industry in that. You know, dairying can get to regenerative agriculture principles pretty quickly. Um, solving methane does take time, um, but even if they only keep chipping away at one percent a year on methane, sorry, <laughs> methane, um, plus, uh, you know, per um, kilogram of meat or um, um, kilogram of milk solids then um, they will get there. And that's the trajectory they've been on for a long time. They will get there. And one of the most important things to look for this coming year uh, is the work of Heiwaka Ekonoa. And this was the uh, body that the um, primary sector suggested to government um, as um, a way of working out and uh, working with government on how to measure, um, uh, mitigate and price agricultural emissions. And um, there's some real um, um, drivers in that, not the least of which is if the government decides that that process, which is due to complete in 2025, is making insufficient progress by the end of, um, um, gosh, is it 21 or 22? Anyway, uh, interim. And then they're going straight into the um, emissions trading scheme, albeit a very modest pricing. But my take on how that works going, and I haven't had a chance to check back with them in the last couple of months, um, is um, that, you know, that work is progressing. So now, um, well, for example, if you go to the um, New Zealand um, Agricultural Greenhouse Gas um, Research Centre's website, uh, they have a wonderful um, part of that called Ag Matters, and again, they have been doing fabulous webinars in recent months, um, exploring of all of these issues. So whilst they're still doing the science, which is how they've been busy since Copenhagen, uh, when they got going, um, they are now being far more articulate about the solutions um, and how this works through. And um, so look, this can be done. I mean, there's, I, I, I'm in no doubt about it. If we, individually and collectively put our minds to this. So, Rob, we've got a question here from Richard Alton. Oh, sorry, Richard Kirkland. We had our National Climate Change Risk Assessment released earlier this year. The National Adaptation Plan is expected in due course. What can we realistically expect of the latter, given your comment of frameworks not being populated with policy? Um, there's a number of big steps in that. Um, I, to me, the most important one um, is the, um, I was trying to find the right language here, um, is the huge work now underway in the second term of government um, on um, bringing the best principles and, and architecture and precedents and knowledge through from the RMA um, into new um, uh, legislation. And so uh, the, um, the guide for all that is the Randerson Report, um, chaired by Tony Randerson, um, who remarkably, almost 30 years ago, um, was involved, um, very heavily involved uh, as a, then a QC, in later years he became a judge, now retired, um, in um, helping the incoming national government uh, work out what had been left behind by um, Sir Geoffrey Palmer's government to give us the RMA. Now, uh, I'm, I'm a, actually a fan of the RMA. Um, um, I think there's a lot of um, good things about it. And the idea, uh, and I appreciate all the frustrations with it, but um, what Tony and the Randerson Report and his colleagues are recommending um, is two pieces of legislation. Um, um, uh, one of which is um, a, a new um, development and environmental uh, legislation, and then a strategic planning legislation alongside it. But they're also advocating um, for um, a particular um, third piece of legislation on, on, on climate, particularly around um, adaptation issues. And I think it's really important to get that piece of, uh, that very important piece of legislation in place over the next few years. And quite honestly, um, the um, biggest thing about adaptation that um, has got to, we've got to sort out before that 
is to make it very clear to people, whether they're in houses or businesses in very climate vulnerable places, um, that exactly what their risks are. And whilst they, we and the rest of society can offer them some help um, in moving, if that's what's required, and for many of them it will be, um, there is no way that um, we can, as a society, um, um, commit a blank check for decades to come to say, oh, well, you just stay where you are and you know if you finally your house gets washed away or your business is no good anymore or your farm's underwater we'll give you the full value for that you know we've just got to get people to realize um that um some people are gonna have to start moving that's um to me um the big part of um, adaptation and there ain't no sea walls high enough um or or um you know coastal defenses strong enough um to um, to stop nature having its way with us. Paul Hoskins, Hoskins got a question here. It takes me a while to work Paul's questions out, but here we go. To what extent is New Zealand's poor performance in addressing emissions when compared to other countries, driven by those other countries having old smokestack industries that could be easily closed down? New Zealand doesn't seem to have such low hanging fruit not to say that we should not let the government's poor performance off the hook. Um, there's a, an awful lot to unpack in that very good question. Um, the first part of it is uh, the extent to which um, what was a heavily polluting old industry in one well-developed country um, becomes a, 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 a probably a less polluting industry in a developing country because new technology is involved and all the rest. And, and uh, the remarkable fact is that um, China is very much the sort of uh, factory of the world, um, and yet its uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, per person only a quarter of ours. And so to some extent, um, we have um, you know, offshored some of those emissions, and there are um, ways of measuring in that which um, sort of uh, gives you a, a, a more balanced view on that. But um, I think that um, uh, we still have plenty of opportunities um, to reduce our emissions um, if we understand that um, the technology we're using now is equally as old and as polluting as those um, industries that you're talking about in developed countries. Um, and um, that's particularly few, um, true of our light vehicle fleet. Um, you know, uh, we're second to Cuba, almost, um, in the um, age and um, emissions of, well, I exaggerate slightly, but we're one of only three OECD countries, um, which doesn't have any um, fuel uh, efficiency or emission standards. Um, and, um, and we import some pretty awful vehicles, um, both new as well as secondhand ones. And um, with countries like the United Kingdom um, now committed to um, ending the sale of petrol and diesel light vehicles in 2030, I mean, that's nine years away. That means that if we don't have um, a similar ambitions on um, clean technology for um, those vehicles, uh, we'll become a dumping ground. Um, and um, if we continue to um, make um, double cab utes um, uh, unrealistically um, uh, underpriced, so there's no fringe benefit tax on them, for example, um, and uh, they're relatively cheap to buy. You get an awful lot of vehicle for a twin cab ute, um, uh, in a twin cab ute. Um, but um, you, the vehicle companies need some help um, of for policy um, and prescription nature, and um, so that they will bring in better vehicles. I mean, Toyota is trying to bring in at least hybrid versions of, um, you know, Hiluxes and, you know, all its other utes, um, but um, it, some support from government um, uh, with some emissions um, and, and fuel efficiency standards uh, would, would be a help. Um, the government is talking about that now in the second term. Um, New Zealand First was a, a huge um, 
roadblock to all that um, in the first term and without them in the coalition that's going to be easier in the second term um, but from what I understand of where that's going so far um, it's not going um, as far or as fast enough as I would like to see um, so for example the um, fee bait scheme that um, Julianne Genta as the associate transport minister had uh, worked up with officials in the first term but was stopped by New Zealand first um, to me is a is a better policy but I want to make one other very big point about um, that transition in vehicles it's not just about um, getting all light vehicles and indeed in due course heavy vehicles um, to zero emissions and um, because that still then leaves an awful lot of vehicles around and um, if you take the particular case of Auckland, but this would be true um, elsewhere around the country. Um, if you look at um, what we need to achieve in reducing our emissions in Auckland, uh, a, a very substantial part, as it is across the whole country, is it's got to come in the light vehicle fleet. And you can't do it just by making all those vehicles over time zero emissions. You've got to um, use less vehicles. and. Um, uh, uh, Paul Winton is a wonderful financial analyst here in Auckland. His website is um, number one word point um, five. Um, and if you, um, and indeed Simon Wilson in the Herald, uh, now two weeks ago had a very good column about Paul's work. Um, that would take you to a very wonderful interactive website um, about uh, transport in Auckland. Um, uh, seriously, good research backed by MR Cagney, uh, done in conjunction with MR Cagney, one of the big transport, internationally famous transport um, consultants, which shows all the steps we need to take. Um, and so more active transport, more walking, more cycling, um, more car sharing, uh, less car ownership. Um, these are all the behavior changes that we need. Um, it's not all about technology. Um, there's a lot of behavior change in here too. But I want to stress it's not behavior change that makes this, you know, a miserable life. I mean, far from it. Um, we know that, um, um, sorry, this is a difficult thing to say, how, <laughs> in many respects, how pleasant life was in the pandemic. We also need to work, of course. Um, but um, we can see how, it, once we take our foot off the neck of nature, that uh, nature does recover remarkably quickly um, and um, that's the opportunity that's the you know the absolute essential thought here about how we humans have to respond and then we have still a very decent life um, but it's one that works entirely with nature not against it well that's interesting this has come up this is the third time it's come up the difference between technical change and adaptive change and you know technical is actually quite easy, finding out a plan, but actually utilising and switching to the plan uh, can be really tricky for humans to do. Yeah. And okay. So, yeah, absolutely. Let's, we've got time for one more short question of this one there. I see Brian McCaw has been very quiet uh, this morning. That's a surprise. Uh, so is there any one last question there? Otherwise, I'm going to wrap up early. Okay, nothing's coming in. Brian's smiling. Rod, um, look, thank you so much uh, for this. You are a phenomenal source of drawing all this stuff together, and I really appreciate your time. Uh, and we had the podcast last January, and we were sort of going to do that every year, and whether you like it or not, we're going to do that every year. So I will be seeing you in January and drawing more out of that magnificent brain uh, of yours. And uh, it is wonderful to have you here drawing from around the world and condensing it for us. Um, one of the things that's come through, Rod, as well, is this the indigenous frameworks that we have access to that we can use. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it sits there, and it's wonderful to see Kate Rawas' work and the Indigenous frameworks coming together, and I haven't seen that before, so I'll be definitely following up with that. Mm -hmm. So, Rod, any last comment from you before we wrap up? 
Yeah, no, you're touching on something that's fundamentally important because I, I touched on to Al Mari um, in, the, in the example of the primary sector. Um, but um, the Auckland Climate Plan, for example, which Council signed off um, a few months back, but then got officially launched this week, um, uh, is very, very powerfully and wonderfully um, set in those terms. Um, and um, I... Um, Waitangi Day this year, um, uh, my newsroom column that weekend was about uh, Matoranga Māori, um, Māori knowledge um, and Te Ao Māori and um, giving examples of where I see this um, fabulously um, informing our future. And one of the examples is in the national science challenges. I, I have a, an occasional infrequently recurring minor role in two of the challenges. Uh, and um, it's uh, designated right from the outset of the National Science Challenges that um, Matarang um is um, really central to them. And it's really exciting um, um, in those science challenges to see Matarang and I, I hate the term, but let's call it Western science, um, working side by side because they're two lenses. And, and when you bring those two lenses together, you get real binocular three, three dimensional vision, if I may say, I'm mangling my metaphors there. Um, but it's really right for who we are and where we are and what we are um, as, a, as a country and as a society. So I, I, I get terribly excited about that. Um, that's to me a constant source of um, inspiration and richness. Wonderful, thank you, Rod. And I know Andrew Melville will be smiling now about the, he's, he's written a book about this, around the weaving of all those together. Rod, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everybody for turning up on time and we're going to finish on time and uh, a stunning, concise piece. But Tina's going to have that up together. We'll email you that in PDF. Uh, we will be continuing this series after in 2021, uh, the need for these conversations does not diminish, it keeps on ramping up. And it's wonderful to see people are starting to pay attention to these topics more and more. So Rod, thank you, uh, a pleasure as always. I'll be in contact about when we have our yeah. chat in the, in the new year. Okay. okay. Go well, thank, thanks, thank you. see you. Thank, Bye.